Hello, I'm Keith Christensen, co-curator together with my Italian colleague Carlo Falciani of the exhibition The Medici, Portraits and Politics 1512 to 1570. I would like to welcome you to Sunday at the Met. This is one of our long running programs which offers the opportunity to explore the permanent collection as well as special exhibitions through conversations, lectures, demonstrations, performances, and much more. Today we have three eminent speakers who are going to address three topics of direct importance to the themes of the exhibition. And I'm confident that their observations will enrich our understanding of this complex period. But before we introduce the speakers, I would like to pass the baton to Carlo, whose deep knowledge of this period was crucial in shaping the exhibition. Carlo. Thank you, Keith. Thank you. I would like to remind our viewers that the exhibition covers the period between 1512 and 1570, when the centuries-old Republic Florence was transformed into a Medici duchy that was imposed upon the city by the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V. Florence was only a minor power in the political chessboard of the great European states of France, Spain, the Empire, and the Papacy. And Cosimo understood that the success of his Tuscan state depended not on arms, but on the power of Florence's language and culture. The vernacular language of Republican Florence, the language of Dante and Petrarch, was transformed in the death of Cosimo's court, a small court, but one that exerted an outsized influence as its representation to the arts became a model for all of Europe. Indeed, the age of Cosimo the I, the Medici, must rank among the most notable for the history of the arts in Italy and Europe. It is a period that is particularly interesting to reflect upon today, when we are thinking anew about identity and the ways in which it is expressed. Although the works of art in the exhibition were created 500 years ago, the issues they address mirror contemporary concerns. Indeed, they provide a key to enable us to reflect upon the women and men who bequeathed to history works of art they hoped would secure them some degree of immortality and give visual form to their aspirations and place in society. Our speakers today will address the intersection of politics and culture and the ways they are reflecting in the works on view. Our first speaker is Nicholas Baker, who teaches at Macquarie University in Sydney. His 2013 book, The Fruit of Liberty, Political Culture in the Florentine Renaissance, 1480 to 1550, traced in a provocative and enlightening way the shifting idea of liberty in Florence as a republic and an autocratic state. His book emphasizes continuity in a time of change. He is currently completing a cultural history exploring how ideas about the future changed in Renaissance Italy around the turn of the 16th century. At the same time, he is also developing a project that will examine the relationship between the wealth produced by the first global economy, that of the 16th century, and the creation of a canon of visual art and literature in Italy. Today, is going to speak about the transformation of the political culture under Cosimo. Thank you, Carlo. As Carlo has noted, the very center of the political transformation of Florence are questions of identity. A communal identity constructed around a common language and a shared cultural and intellectual heritage descended from the city's Republican past. Cosmo founded a state institution, the Accademia Fiorentino, to promote this heritage, which had, its, had as its center the poetry of Dante and of Petrarch. Our second speaker has made a fundamental contribution to our understanding of that literary culture. Deborah Parker teaches at the University of Virginia. Her book, Bronzino, Renaissance Painter as Poet, is cited throughout the exhibition catalog, and this remarkable publication was followed by a book titled Michelangelo and the Art of Letter Writing. Her current project is a book-length study, The Past as Prompt, 
Global Encounters with Dante. So once again, we have a theme about past and present, the very thing that's at the center of our current conversations about the character of our inherited culture. Her talk will focus on two icons in the exhibition, Bronzino's allegorical portrait of Dante and Vasari's portrait of six Tuscan poets. Now our third speaker will address one of the most visually distinctive aspects of the works of art in the exhibition. At a time when fashion garners such attention and plays such an important aspect of declaring publicly who we are, we felt it was important to address this topic in its 16th century context. So I'm very pleased that our third speaker is Elizabeth Curry, an independent scholar whose publications include Fashion and Masculinity in Renaissance Florence, a book that takes us right into the wardrobe of those male and female clothes horses we see in the gallery. And it elucidates the Florentine notion of masculinity in what was a very masculine-centered society. Professor Curry is interested in his histories of dress, fashion, and textiles as they relate to the body and to gender. She's currently working on a book about the clothing of everyday people in Italian Baroque art. Her talk today is titled, Dress Codes, Reading Fashion in Florentine Portraiture. And she will discuss how the type of dress depicted in, the portrait, in portraits was mediated by notions of decorum, political context, and gender norms, setting against the broader backdrop of Florentine fashion. These are talks I'm so looking forward to hearing. So let us begin our lecture series with Nicholas Baker. Nicholas. How does a republic die? To paraphrase Hemingway on going broke very slowly and all of a sudden. The Republic of Renaissance Florence declined slowly over six decades in the 15th century, becoming increasingly subject to the will of the Medici family and their partisans. The end, when it came, occurred quite swiftly over the space of five years. The Medici were expelled in 1527, returned in 1530, following a 10-month-long siege by the army of Emperor Charles V, and then in 1532, the Republican constitution was dismantled and replaced by a hereditary principality. But if changing the institutions of government is something that can occur quickly, the transformation of Republican citizens into the subjects of a prince takes more time. So the very slowly part continued into the 1530s and 1540s, the, the, the period of time covered, or at least part of the period of time covered by this wonderful exhibition. Political institutions can be changed at the stroke of a pen. Political culture takes longer to transform. This is the question I want to focus on uh, in, this, in this brief talk. How the citizens of Florence transformed themselves from self-governing civilian magistrates into courtiers and subjects. But first, let's take a step back and be clear what we're talking about. The city of Florence, like all the cities of north central Italy, had become effectively self governing during the Middle Ages. The larger cities, such as Florence, conquered smaller towns and cities nearby. They became city states. While most of these city states had become principalities, by the period of the Renaissance, such as the duchies of Milan, Ferrara and Urbino. A few, such as Florence, Genoa and Venice, remained as they had been since the Middle Ages, effectively republics governed not by princes, but by councils and committees of citizens. The Republic of Florence during the Renaissance, however, in no way resembled a modern pluralist liberal democracy. Citizenship was an exclusive, not an inclusive category. It was a private club, a corporate group in the city. To become a member of this club, to become a citizen, you needed to be a man. You needed to be a taxpayer and have paid your taxes. And you needed to be a member of one of the 21 statutory guilds of Florence, professional or trade organisations that controlled every aspect of a specific industry. So only a minority 
of the actual population of the city counted as citizens. Only a minority of the population could participate in the councils and committees that formed the government of the city. We can call these, uh, these men the office-holding class, the men who could hold offices in the Republican government. Everyone else, women of all social groups, the labouring classes, the enslaved, everyone else was, in, was excluded. This fresco, completed in the 1480s by Domenico Ghirlandaio and his workshop for the chancel, it's the, 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 main, the chapel behind the main altar, in the Basilica of Santa Maria Novella, on behalf of Giovanni Tornabuoni, captures this sense of the public space of the city as a male one. The sacred narrative, the angel appearing to Zacharias to foretell the birth of his son, John the Baptist, takes second stage to the ranks of mature men dressed in varying shades of red who fill the middle plane of the image, the men of the office-holding class. Three adolescent boys, not yet old enough to qualify for office, are safely contained in the lower right-hand corner. A group of four young women are pushed to the back right-hand side, almost out of the picture. The men of the office-holding class take centre stage and dominate the scene. The painting asserts the proper order of things in late 15th century Republican Florence. The painting also expresses the two key ideas or mythologies of Republican Florence, equality and liberty. The appearance of the men is central to this. They are dressed in the uniform of office holding, the red robes worn by members of the governing councils on ceremonial occasions. The garment so ubiquitous, ubiquitously associated with honour and power that Machiavelli cripped two lengths of red cloth make a gentleman. The uniform appearance cultivated an image of equality of the men of the office holding class as an egalitarian fraternity of citizens and governors. This was the Republican myth or ideal of equality, the idea that every male citizen had an equal opportunity to participate in the government of the city-state. The deliberate appearance of these men dressed to hold public office also illustrates the second myth or ideal, liberty. In the political culture of the Florentine Republic, liberty had two meanings. It meant both a government by citizens, as opposed to a government by a prince, and freedom from foreign rule. The citizens of Republican Florence governed themselves rather than being subject either to a prince or to a distant foreign ruler. Of course, the varying distances the men stand from the sacred narrative indicates that not all men were actually created equal, not to mention the women who stand furthest from the heart of the image. The office-holding class of Florence was fluid and heterogeneous, ranging from fabulously wealthy merchant bankers to local retailers. There was also a fair degree of social and political mobility in Renaissance Florence. Individuals and families rose and fell in status. New men entered the ranks of the citizenship. The true elite of the office-holding class, men like Giovanni Tornabuoni, needed to find ways to distinguish themselves and justify their social and political status. They found the perfect vehicle to do so in the realm of material culture, in bricks and mortar, in paint and stone. They inscribed themselves on the material fabric of the city, building palaces, decorating family chapels, such as Giovanni Tornabuoni's in Santa Maria Novella, giving their names to streets and piazzas. In doing so, they claimed and asserted their status, building up a profound, almost existential connection to the physical city. They cultivated and demonstrated a sense of possession over the city, as well as a sense of inevitability or even eternity that justified the arbitrary, the arbitrary socio-political organisation as the natural order of things. Florence, the physical city, belong to the office-holding class. But this connection ran in the opposite direction also. The office-holding class 
belonged to the city too. They had no status or legitimacy beyond its walls, outside of the material world they had created for themselves. This image from another chapel decorated around the same time in the 1480s demonstrates this effectively. It too is painted by Ghirlandaio and his workshop, um, this time for the chapel of Francesco Sassetti in the church of Santa Trinita. Again, we see how the ranks of Florentine citizens take precedence in image. The narrative of the painting, Pope Honorius III, confer confirming the rule of the Franciscan order, takes second place. But Ghirlandaio and Sassetti made another noticeable choice. The historical de event depicted occurred in Rome, but here we can clearly see in the background one of the most distinctive public spaces of Florence, the Palazzo Vecchio, its adjacent loggia, and the piazza surrounding it. This choice underlines the connection between the men of the office-holding class and the physical city of Florence. The Republican political culture endured despite the fact that a single family came to dominate the city of Florence, the Medici. In the 15th century, the Medici controlled the government of the city for six decades and four generations from 1434 to 1494. They did so not as ruling princes, but as bosses of a political faction. They maintained, but manipulated the Republican institutions, using access to political office and taxation to reward allies and punish enemies. Francesco Sassetti in his chapel not so subtly demonstrates his own friendship with the Medici by having himself painted standing next to Lorenzo the Magnificent. Uh, Sassetti is the, is the bald gentleman, uh, second from the right, uh, and then Lorenzo uh, de Medici is, is the figure third from the right, standing next to him. The rule of the Medici faction was never absolute. Every decade they faced at least one serious challenge to their position, and their survival depended on balancing their own interests against those of the wider office holding class, making sure of sufficient access to the most prestigious and important positions in government, never monopolising these for themselves, while maintaining their grip on power. They also relied on their prestige and connections with ruling princes and popes in other Italian cities to defend and promote Florentine political and economic interests. As their rule became increasingly princely, the support of the wider office holding class depended on the maintenance of the institutions and culture of republicanism. So this was the very slowly part of the death of the Florentine Republic. The Medici and their supporters corrupted the institutions of the Republic, but they did so slowly over generations and decades without ever abandoning the culture of Republicanism. The Medici managed this balancing act until larger European events intervened, disrupting not only Florence, but the entire Italian peninsula. In 1494, Charles VIII, King of France, invaded Italy to claim the southern kingdom of Naples. This sparked a series of conflicts known as the Italian Wars, fought largely between the French and Spanish crowns for, for predominance in Italy and Europe. The course of these wars was the dizzying helter-skelter of changing allegiances and brutal conflict. In Florence, the course of events saw the Medici expelled in 1494 only to return in 1512, and expelled again in 1527, only to return in 1530. On each occasion, the family was expelled because their dominance seemed to threaten the liberty of Florence, the city's independence, bringing foreign soldiers and powers too close to control over the city. On each occasion, they returned by force of arms supplied by the Spanish crown, and the city lost a little more of its Republican culture. The end of the Florentine Republic, as I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, came in August 1530. Since October the previous year, the city had been besieged by the army of Emperor Charles V, who was also the King of Spain, financed by Pope Clement VII, 
whose birth name was Giulio de' Medici. Starved into submission, Florence surrendered on the 12th of August, 1530, in order to prevent the complete destruction of the city or its conquest by the imperial army. Liberty, remember, in the mythology of Republican Florence had two meanings, meaning both government by citizen councils and also freedom from foreign rule. Also remember the profound existential connection between the physical city and the office holding class. The governors of Republican Florence had no status outside of the city and their place in it. They were merchants and shopkeepers in a Europe of nobles and kings. If Florence became subject to direct imperial rule, they would lose not only their independence, but also their status. Faced with this prospect, they chose what appeared to be the lesser of two evils, the institution of the Medici as hereditary princes, instead of accepting a distant foreign ruler. If the closest allies and partisans of the Medici actively pursued the reorganisation of the city-state into a principality, the majority of the office-holding class assented begrudgingly and only in the name of defending Florence's independence. This was the all-of-a-sudden element of the end of the Republic. In the space of five years, from 1527 to 1532, the Medici were expelled, returned, and transformed the Florence that they had ruled in all but name into a principality that they ruled openly. However, as I suggested at the beginning, the passage from republic to principality could not be accomplished simply by changing the institutions of the state. The 1530s were a troubled decade for Florence. The Florentine office-holding class struggled to adapt to the new realities of princely rule. A significant body of rebels and exiles, inveterate enemies of the Medici, threatened to plunge the city into another war and even another siege with the aid of the French monarchy. The first Medici prince, Alessandro, was assassinated in January 1537 by his cousin and constant companion, which threatened further intervention and perhaps even annexation by the emperor. Alessandro's successor, Cosimo I de' Medici, who features so prominently in this exhibition, was, at the time, an untried youth. This portrait of Ugolino Martelli, one of many similar paintings produced by Bronzino and Francesco Sassetti during the 1530s and 1540s, helps to document the shifting role of the office-holding class in the early years of the Principality. The contrast with the 15th century images is immediate. Instead of a community of red-robed civilian magistrates, here we have a young man dressed in the courtly fashion of the day, in black, and engaged in the solitary pursuit of reading. The elite of the city continued to hold offices under the principality, but when they imagined themselves now, it was paradoxically no longer as office holders. Martelli is as far removed from the pursuit of public service as could be imagined, the text is reading the Iliad, Homer's account of the Trojan War, also suggests that the realm of politics and war now remained confined to literature. But the image does contain some elements of continuity with the earlier frescoes, principally the importance of place, the abiding connection of the elite with the physical city. The space in which Martelli appears is definably Florentine, the window to his left, so that's the, the right side of the, of the painting, uh, mimics Michelangelo's famous kneeling window for the Medici Palace, which appeared in copies all over the city. While behind his right shoulder, we can see a sculpture of David with the head of Goliath, identified as the work as, of Antonio Rossellini. The figure of David had represented the defence of Florentine liberty since the early 15th century in the sculptures of Donatello and Michelangelo installed at the Palazzo Vecchio. But here, the meaning of this icon has shifted. The office-holding class, represented by Martelli, 
maintain civic harmony and unity and preserve Florence's independence by surrendering the political freedoms of the Republican era. By supporting the Principality, the elite defended Florence's liberty, as they always had done, keeping the state in Florentine hands and preventing any civic conflict that could provide an opportunity for Charles V to annex the city as an imperial possession. The dismantling of the Florentine Republic and the creation of the Principality was not simply imposed on Florence by the will of the Medici and the support of external powers such as Emperor Charles V. It was not something that was simply done to the citizens of Florence. Rather, the citizens of Florence were participants in the process. Some were active participants, either supporting and furthering the will of the Medici or opposing and resisting it. But the majority were more passive participants, slowly accommodating themselves to the new institutional reality by preserving as much as they could of the political culture of the Republic, assuring themselves that they were still defending the liberty of Florence, even as they transformed themselves into subjects, both political and painted. Uh, thank you. I will hand over uh, now to, to Deborah Parker. Thank you, Nicholas. It's a great pleasure to be here. The Medici Portraits and Power is a stunning exhibition. The curators have brought together an impressive number of works and arrayed them in ways which prompt fresh reflections on the art and power of Renaissance portraiture. It's wonderful to view similar portraits next to one another. I shall focus today on two paintings, Bronzino's allegorical, allegorical portrait of Dante and Vasari's portrait of six Tuscan poets. And I will concentrate on a few elements, how dramatically Bronzino reimagines Dante's appearance, how these paintings differ from the other portraits in the show, and how they reflect contemporary literary concerns. Let's begin with Dante's appearance. No one knows what Dante looked like. A death mask exists, but historical information on it is sketchy. The two earliest portraits of Dante uh, in the Bargello, and this is the first uh, slide, and another portrait in the former Palazzo dei Giudici e Notai are distinctly different from one another. Ocaccio, who wrote the first biography of Dante, offers the only physical description of the poet. He reports that Dante's face was long, his nose aquiline, his eyes rather large than small, and his jaws heavy. His complexion was dark, and his hair and beard black and crisp, and his countenance always sad and thoughtful. The features which have been most frequently uh, preserved by artists are the poet's aquiline nose, dark hair, and thoughtful uh, countenance. We can see these features in two mid-15th century poet, uh, works, Botticelli's portrait and Domenico di Michelino's Dante reading from his poem. Domenico portrays Dante amidst the three realms of the afterlife. Above loom the heavens of paradise. In the middle, we see the mountain of purgatory. And in the lower left corner, a mixture of inferno elements, the gate of hell, the neutrals, and Satan. On the right, we see Florence, more precisely, Quattrocento Florence, and Brunelleschi's dome prominently displayed. Domenico introduced a number of new elements. A laurel crown graces the poet's cappuccio, his cap, and he wears a red lupo, a long tunic-like garment. Dante holds a book open to the first lines of Inferno I. Bronzino's allegorical portrait of Dante differs from these earlier productions in notable ways. Like Domenico di Michelino, Bronzino shows Dante amidst the three realms of the comedy, but these elements are subordinated to the immense figure of the poet. Dante's face, 
portrayed off profile has been softened and the bone structure of his face carefully modeled. Dante's red garment falls in soft sweeping folds and the artist has foreshortened the poet's right arm. He is seated in a contrapostal pose. His head turns to the right, while his upper body turns slightly to the left and his legs to the right. The pose resembles the stance of one of Michelangelo's seated in Udi. The twisting pose, Dante's magisterial stance, and the use of foreshortening exemplify some of the hallmarks of the Bella Maniera, the beautiful style which characterizes other elegant portraits in the exhibition. Dante has never appeared more grandly majestic. Well, the figure of Dante dominates the poem, the, the painting. The open book he holds is also conspicuous. Dante appears in partial darkness, his face and torso illuminated by light that shines down from above that reveals the passage to which the comedy is open. The words are clearly legible. They are from the first 48 lines of Canto 25 above the Paradiso. The volume is distinctive, both for its massive size and the passage featured. Just as Bronzino enhances Dante's grandeur by giving him Michelangelo's proportions, so is this folio unusually big, far exceeding the dimensions of many early modern manuscripts or printed editions of the poem. The reason is likely practical. The original painting was intended for the lunettes of the bedroom of Bronzino's patron, the Florentine banker, Bartolomeo Bettini. The volume and the words had to be visible from below. Let's consider now the significance of the passage displayed. And here we see a detail of the book and on the, uh, the right, the words of the canto in Italian and the English translation. In these poignant lines, Dante expresses his ardent desire to return to Florence and be crowned poet laureate. Dante, Florence's most famous exile, condemns the cruelty of those who banished him from his beloved native city, the bello o vile o vile dormi agnello, the fair foe where I slept, a lamb. In the painting, Dante's great aspiration has been realized. Bronzino shows the poet wearing the coveted laurel crown over his red cap. This passage from Paradiso 25 would have also resonated strongly with Bronzino's patron, Bartolomeo Bettini, a Republican who left Florence for Rome in 1536, shortly after the tyrannical Alessandro de' Medici became the first Duke of Florence in 1529. Hence, the book in Bronzino's work expresses a complex psychology, the inevitable contradictions an exile would experience in thinking of the bel ovile, the fair foe, from which he has been banished. At the same time, Dante seems to be contemplating the transcendence of earthly aspirations as he looks toward the mountain of purgatory where sin is purged. Bronzino's painting offers a noble, majestic portrait of the poet, but the artist also pays homage to Dante in his poetry as well, albeit in a decidedly less reverent key. Few admirers of Bronzino's art know that he was also a prolific poet. The exhibition includes two ma paper manuscripts of Bronzino's poetry. This is one of the poems here, La Cipolla del Bronzino Pittore. The last lines of this burlesque poem uh, uh, reveal just how familiar he was with the opening of Paradiso 25. Burlesque is a scurrilous genre of poetry, full of punning allusions and sensual, sexual innuendo. Words have a double meaning, a literal and an erotic one. In this parodic reworking of Dante, the poet is now the speaker, and like Dante, he, he desires recognition 
for his poetic accomplishments, but the speaker shows no interest in being crowned poet laureate or in the topic of exile. A crown of onions substitutes the laurel crown of poets. This slide shows Bronzino's uh, The Last Lines of La Cipolla and an English translation. Bron Bronzino also introduces elements foreign to Dante's conception, notably the declaration that the poet who surpasses him in praising onions can add a zero to my nine, to a, a can add to my nine a zero. Literally, the line proclaims that this poet would be 10 times a better writer than Bronzino. Adding a zero to nine makes 90. But read in terms of the erotic significance accorded numbers in burlesque poetry, the line acquires a very different meaning. Zero, because of its circular form, often represents the anus in burlesque poetry. Nine is considered a phallic symbol due to its shape. The artist then suggests that the reward for poetic achievement will that he will sodomize his successor or be sodomized by his predecessor. Bronzino's adaptation goes beyond a comic reworking of Dante's lines. The eroticizing of words makes the poem a particularly impudent parody. While there's no direct connection between the allegorical portrait of Dante and La Cipolla, both works are homages to Dante, one respectful, the painting, the other transgressive, the poem. Bronzino's saucy reworking of Dante reminds us of his slyness as an artist poet. While well, the paintings, especially his portraits, are famously resistant to interpretation, I'm thinking of the frozen, impenetrable countenances of his sitters. His burlesque poems reveal a more open and raucous sensibility. In the portrait and the poem, Bronzino shows his adroit adroitness in adopting different approaches to a canonical work. He can create refined tributes and just as nimbly dismantle them. There are ludic elements in his art. And I will confine myself to showing one example, the Met's young man. Check out the large grotesque faces on the table and on the chair. These grotesques unsettle this image of suave poise and elegance. Let's return to the book in the painting. Here book history allows us to see the nuance of Bronzino's expression. The large folio which Dante holds from, uh, differs from other books we see in um, the portraits in the exhibition. Dante is the only subject who holds a large copy of his own work. The other, the other sitters hold much smaller books. As the object labels explain, books underscore the social status of the, send of the sitters and their literary affinities. Sitters with books include Bronzino's Young Man, Bronzino's Young Girl, uh, Bronzino's Laura Battiferri, Titian's Benedetto Varchi, and Contormo's Portrait of a Man with a Book. Books like the refined clothing and jewelry worn by many of the sitters are attributes, luxury attributes. All these subjects hold small volumes octavos, duodecimos, or even smaller formats. The octavo format, which is smaller in size than folios and quartos, was first introduced in 1501 by the humanist printer Aldus Minucius, dedicated to patrician Venetians, scholars, and diplomats. These elegant editions exude an air of exclusivity. These are all different, um, this slide shows different sized edition, printed editions of Dante's comedy. Uh, the first one is a folio edition, uh, the second one is a miniature Petrarch, and then the third one is uh, Aldous Minucius's 1502 um, all, uh, edition of the comedy. Later print, uh, printers published these, favored these small formats, commonly known as Dantini and 
and Petrarchini, Little Dante Volumes, Little Petrarchs. The printer Alessandro Paganino introduced a 24mo edition of Dante. This term, 24mo, refers to the number of times a sheet of paper is folded to create the gatherings, which then become the, pa uh, the pages. Like the refined clothing and decorative objects, and here's one other image of a 24mo edition of Petrarch and the Aldine 1502 edition of Dante. The person holding them gives you a sense of just how small uh, these volumes are. Like the refined clothing and decorous objects we see in many of the portraits, these small portable books enhance the aristocratic reserve which Cosimo de Medici and his contemporaries sought to project. Statesmen, men and women of letters, could easily carry these tasteful volumes in their various social spheres. Such books have a double function. They convey a sense of the sitter's cultural capital, even as they participate in a display of wealth. All the portraits I've discussed so far feature a single sitter. Let's turn now to a, a group portrait and consider how Vasari portrays a different kind of eminence, literary eminence, in his portrait of six Tuscan poets. A work rich in literary allusions, the painting features six poets engaged in animated discussions, surrounded by books and instruments of learning. In the choice of sitters and their arrangement, Vasari and his patron collaborated upon a presentation which offers a remarkably sophisticated account of literary distinction. The subject was likely suggested by Luca Martini, one of the most active promoters of, cult of culture cultural exchange between artists and writers in Florence. We have one luminary, Dante, seated among other poets. To his right, Guido Cavalcanti, and on the right, the two humanists, Cristoforo Landino and Marsilio Ficino, then Petrarch holding a volume of his own canzoniere, and Boccaccio who faces his friend Petrarch. The decision to portray six poets is not arbitrary. In Limbo, the first circle of Dante's uh, Inferno, which houses the virtuous heathens, Dante finds himself among the greatest poets of antiquity, Homer, Virgil, Ovid, Lucan, and Horace. After a brief confabulation, the members of this Bella Scola, the splendid school, invite Dante to join their distinguished ranks, making him sesto tra cotanto seno, sixth among such intellects. Vasari's painting presents a reworking of the limbo scene. In the painting, Dante is no longer a neophyte, the newest member of this elite group, but amidst his contemporaries and near contemporaries. In the Inferno, Dante portrays Homer as the sovereign poet, but in Vasari's painting, Dante assumes this role, no longer the sixth among such intellects, but the sovereign poet. Vasari emphasizes Dante's eminence in a number of ways. Seated upon a traditional Florentine chair, Dante cut, Dante's figure cuts a dynamic swath across the picture. Bronzino's influence is evident in the contrapostal pose and Dante's noble features. No longer wearing red, the traditional color of his garments in earlier portraits, Dante's lupo is now rose, the color famously favored by Leonardo and prominently, prominently featured in two other portraits in the exhibition. Pon, um, Pontormo's young man on the right and Bronzino's young man uh, on the left. The rose color of Dante's garment in Vasari's portrait of six Tuscan poets, not to mention the twisting pose, makes Vasari's work a distinctly Renaissance portrait. All the other poets are standing, paying court to their sovereign. Petrarch, who had taken minor orders, appears in, a, in an ecclesiastical habit, holding a copy of the canzoniere, 
and identified by the portrait of Laura on the cover. Boccaccio stands behind Dante and Petrarch, and Guido Cavalcanti appears to be engaged in a conversation with Dante about Virgil. While in the other portraits, the books appear largely as attributes of sophistication, devotion, or literary culture, in the six Tuscan poets, we have a veritable book club in which Dante and Cavalcanti discuss Virgil and Petrarch displays his book to Dante. Vasari, Vasari underscores Dante's dominance by emphasizing the poet's reach through the objects on the table, which include a quadrant, a celestial and terrestrial globe, a compass, books, and a pen a, and a pen and inkstand. Together, the instruments symbolize the arts of astronomy, astrology, geometry, cosmography, and geography. The books, pen, and inkstand are traditional symbols for the scholar or writer. The various arts symbolized by these objects reflect the comedy's encyclopedic breadth, an aspect of the poem frequently highlighted in lectures delivered before the Accademia Fiorentina, the cultural institution devoted to the advancement of Tuscan culture, which operated under Cosimo's patronage. While elsewhere in Italy, Petrarch was touted as the supreme exemplar of the Tuscan dialect. In Florence, Dante's supremacy was undisputed. In its insta installation of Dante as the Poeta Sobrano, Vasari visualizes another line from Inferno 4 describing Aristotle. Aristotle, tutti lo miran, tutti, tutti onor li fanno. They all look up to him, all do him honor. Vasari essentially visualizes this line transposing the object of veneration from Homer to Dante. Poetry reaches its apex in Dante's achievement. Bronzino and Vasari present resounding affirmations of Dante's centrality to Tuscan literary culture. Many of the exhibition's object cards refer to debates over literary eminence in the 16th century. But this debate over Dante's and Petrarch's preeminence does not take place in words alone. Bronzino's allegorical portrait of Dante and Vasari's portrait of six Tuscan poets proclaim Dante's supremacy stunningly. This seems a fitting conclusion to draw in 2021, the 700th centenary of Dante's death. And I now shall pass the baton on to our next speaker, uh, Elizabeth Curry. Thank you very much, Deborah, for that fascinating talk. Um, I'm going to carry on now with a look at fashion in Florentine portraiture, specifically reading fashion um, through portraits. And the exhibition offers a really unique opportunity to explore Florentine flash fashion during a period of great political and cultural change. And in this talk, I'm going to share some thoughts about how to interpret clothing represented in portraiture as a reflection of the broader fashion system as a whole as well as contemporary ideas about social hierarchies and status, gender and the body. I'm sure that anyone who's lucky enough to visit the exhibition or read the catalogue will be struck by how many of the portraits are of men clad predominantly in black or in dark tones. In his Lives of the Most Excellent Painters, Sculptors and Architects, Giorgio Vasari enthused over the varieties of black in a portrait painted by Sebastiano del Piombo of the poet and author Pietra Retino from around 1525, which we can see here. And Vasari wrote, it's a very wonderful painting to see the difference between the five or six different shades of black he's wearing, velvet, satin, sarsenet, damask, and woolen cloth, and a very black beard above all these other blacks. Unfortunately, the condition of the painting has deteriorated, so it's not easy to trace the, fact, the effects that Vasari admired. However, in the exhibition, there are very many precisely recorded tactile descriptions of fabrics. At first glance, all these rather somber outfits can seem quite uniform, but on closer inspection, our eyes begin to adjust to their nuances. Bronzino's portrait of Lorenzo Lenzi is an excellent example of the way that visual interest was achieved in male dress, despite, or perhaps as a result of, this limited chromatic scale. The adolescent wears a doublet and hose made of a wool boucle with a nap, 
that is highlighted in specific areas around his sleeves um, and his silhouette. Showing fibers and fabrics in the round like this is very typical of Florentine portraiture from these decades. It's visible also along the sleeves of another portrait in the exhibition, um, Bronzino's portrait of a young man with a book. Um, and we could perhaps see this fascination with the three-dimensional effects of textiles um, as feeding into the contemporary debate about the relative merits of painting versus sculpture. Lorenzo's black berry absorbs the light, suggesting that it's a cut velvet or perhaps a very fine wool. Um, and his silk sleeves are made of an excess of fabric, creating puzzled folds with a very kind of lustrous sheen to them. And we can see another silk ribbon tied around his waist. So against this largely monochrome background, the very small metallic details of his belt buckle and of the aglets that tie the placard of his doublet, um, they're really thrown into relief. Now, silk was often used in very kind of limited quantities in male outfits in order to avoid ostentatious, uh, ostentation. And the lustrous qualities of silk were thought to be more frivolous. Um, one aspect of this is the fact that silk was thought inappropriate for the first stages of mourning dress. Now, 16th century Florentines would have viewed these portraits very much as textile connoisseurs with a considered appreciation of the value of the garments and the skills involved in creating them. Many Florentine families had developed and built their fortunes by investing in local silk and wool companies, something that set them apart from longer established court aristocratic court societies um, and where these kinds of mercantile interests would have been frowned upon. And at this time, tailors didn't carry a stock of materials themselves, so courtiers had to source all the fabrics and notions that were needed to make their clothing. Although black wasn't the most expensive dye stuff, that distinction went to shades of red, such as crimson, a deep, solid, even black was very much sought after. Establishing the necessary retail networks to obtain the types of textiles depicted in these paintings required effort and discernment, as well as very substantial amounts of money. Now, being able to distinguish um, between fabrics made of linen, wool, or silk was a measure of an artist's skill and a very sought after aspect of portraiture. Understated colors were also a good choice for patrons who had one eye on posterity. For centuries, writers on art have advised prioritizing dignity and modesty over frivolous fashions that might seem foolish 50 years hence. One early example of this can be found in Leonardo da Vinci's treatise on painting, where he recommended, as far as possible, avoid the costumes of your own day. Costumes of our period should not be depicted unless it be on tombstones, so that we may be spared being laughed at by our successors for the mad fashions of men and leave behind only things that may be admired for their dignity and beauty. But wealthy Florentines didn't just buy black garments because they painted well. The Venetian author Lodovico Dolce offered some reasons for the appeal of black in his book on color symbolism, Il Dialogo di Colori, that was um, published in 1565. He described the color as possessing a certain virility and moderation. Um, he also said that it was represented steadfastness because it couldn't be transformed into any other color. To present oneself as moderate and steadfast was particularly important in Florence during the first decades of ducal rule, when, as we have seen, there was a residual sense of the city's more egalitarian nature as compared with the longer established courts of Italy and abroad. Even in the 1550s, two decades after the establishment of ducal rule, Florentine Giovanni della Casa continued to see a distinction between court fashions with their feathers, flamboyance and embroideries, um, and Florentine ones. In his famous etiquette book, The Galateo, he suggested, perhaps what is customary for Neapolitans, whose city is rich in men of great lineage and great, bar and great um, uh, prestige, would not do, for example, for people of Lucca or Florentines, who are for the most part merchants and simple gentlemen, and have among them neither princes, nor counts, nor barons. Therefore, the stately and pompous manners of Naples transferred to Florence, like the clothes of a big man put on a little one, would seem baggy and superfluous. As a Republican sympathizer, it cannot have been far from Delacarza's mind that Eleonora di Toledo herself, as the second daughter of the Viceroy of Naples, really grew up surrounded by this kind of pomp and circumstance. After her marriage to Cosimo in 1539, 
Eleonora maintained many of her Spanish customs. In fact, she introduced um, uh, some of them to the Florentine court, but she also made concessions to more modest local styles. Now, Eleonora is now mostly associated with this fabulous, um, fabulously opulent uh, brocaded velvet gown that Bronzino painted her in with her son Giovanni. And here I'm going to show you uh, one of the several fragments um, uh, of brocaded velvet that might have been woven at the same time and that survived today in Italian museum collections. However, she really reserved garments like this um, with such precious fabrics only for state occasions and also for um, domestic interiors and for more everyday wear she wore plain fabrics like damask, taffeta um, or plain velvet. And the gown that she was buried in is one example of this. It's an oyster um, or white satin that's decorated with velvet bands that are embroidered with metal threads. The call for simplicity was often reiterated in fashion advice for men over the course of the 16th century. So one example of this is um, Sabada Castiglione, the religious figure and author, who warned young men, a group, a social group that was particularly seen to be susceptible to the dangers of fashion, to shun all signs of excess, to always be grave, plain and modest. Um, and he ordered them to or suggested that they avoided lace, edgings, fringing, slashing, stripes, borders and, and other types of embroidery. So he very much thought that fashion was something beneath men and the aspects that he picked it out tended to be categorised as more feminine than masculine partly as a means of enforcing and delineating um, prescribed gender norms and distinctions. And we can see the impact of these attitudes in various portraits in the exhibition. So for example, in menswear, we see that pattern was very much limited um, to more monochrome types of motifs. So we can see in the um, Rosso Fiorentino portrait of a man on the right, he wears a black damask, um, it's patterned, but it's still quite subdued. Um, and again, in the fragment of cut embroidered velvet, where the pattern is created through the technique of the, of the weaving itself, rather than through different kinds of colours, which might have been considered more feminine. Um, the gender conventions governing clothing were thrown into relief in double portraiture. So we can see this in the portraits again from the exhibition, sought to show the banker Pier Antonio Bandini and his wife Cassandra Cavalcanti Bandini. Um, and husbands and wives' clothing often, uh, husbands and wives often mirrored one another in their clothing as they do here. So his red doublet echoes Cassandra's um, red overgown. And both their garments are decorated with double bands of velvet and they wear damask with the same motif. However, Pier Antonio's outfit, although it's opulent and very rich, it somewhat takes a back seat to his wife's very vibrant, bejeweled appearance, which places her very much as the primary consumer of fashion here. Even though menswear often conformed to ideas of moderation and restraint, Dress and portraits was still a key tool for conveying the sense of the individual, their inner attributes, as well as their tangible qualities. And we can see this um, in, in various paintings, including the portrait of a young man um, by Pontormo, who is usually identified as Carlo Neroni. And whether or not this portrait was painted um, around the time of the siege of Florence or rather afterwards that there's some discussion around this he is still very much depicted as a man of action and his red beret is a very um, unusually bright accessory a color that had military associations and we can see it being uh, featuring prominently in the portrait by Pontormo thought to be of Francesco Guardi the halberdier now, bright colours were obviously necessary in order to stand out on the battlefield. Um, but additionally uh, to this, writings on colour symbolism suggested that red was a kind of enlivening and warming colour that would draw the blood to the surface of the skin um, yeah. and thereby enhance natural valour and bravery. Now, Neroni wears a black jerkin or coletto, another garment that was often worn by soldiers. And we can see it depicted here in an engraving um, from Cesare Vecellio's costume book from 1590, uh, where a bravo is shown in a coletto. A bravo we normally translate as a, as a mercenary or a foot soldier. Um, and he's wearing, Vecellio tells us, a jerkin of goatskin, deerskin or chamois leather. 
With its kind of pained and slashed decoration, Carlo Neroni's jerkin is more of a decorative than a fashionable, uh, sorry, than a purely defensive garment. However, its protective qualities were enhanced by wearing it over a padded doublet. Leather jerkins were worn in many circumstances that could put the wearer into uh, physical danger. So we've said on the battlefield, but also in civic spaces um, and for sporting activities such as hunting. A few decades after Neroni's portrait was painted, news reached the Medici court of a hunting accident involving the French king, Charles IX. It was reported that the king would even have lost his arm if it had not been for his reinforced clothing which consisted of a good gown made of wool skin, a buffalo leather jerkin with sleeves, and a big doublet with sleeves stuffed with a lot of cotton wadding, so very much the kind of clothing that Neroni is shown wearing in the portrait. Both leather and animal furs could project a more masculine, forceful um, uh, sense um, of presence than lustrous silks, and fur and silk worn in conjunction um, convey virility and sophistication in a portrait of Bindo Altoviti, papal banker and art patron. Now, Altoviti is shown wearing one of the various types of overgown, the third layer of clothing that men would usually wear, um, certainly for formal occasions and when they were outdoors. Um, and we can get a sense of when, how, what kind of role the third layer, this third layer, um, took on through correspondence surrounding the portrait um, showing Eleonora di Toledo and her son Francesco um, from around 1550. So the Duchess wrote uh, requesting that Bronzino portrayed her eight-year-old son and heir wearing an overgarment, a roba, because she thought that um, just showing him in a doublet and hose really wasn't fitting to his station um, at this time and to his age. Um, as was suitable for an older man, Altovita's fur-lined robe conveys a sense of gravitas and ease. In my view, um, this portrait suggests the kind of intellectual escape that's summoned up in the exiled Machiavelli's letter to his friend Francesco Vettori in 1513. Machiavelli wrote, Once the evening has arrived, I come home and enter my study. In the entryway, I take off my daytime clothing covered with mud and dirt, and I put on garments that are royal and fit for a court. Changed into suitable clothes, I step into the ancient courts of ancient men. The sumptuously dressed intimate space of, Altovi of the Altoviti portrait is certainly suggestive of a study. And it's interesting that um, uh, he's always shown with his head covered in the various representations of him that we have, um, and including the ones in the exhibition. So here we can see um, uh, the beautifully detailed coif or hairnet um, in a back view of the um, bronze bust by Benvenuto Cellini. And we can see a very similar coif um, in an engraving of Pietro Aretino by Marcantonio Raimondi. And here he's wearing it underneath a hat. Medical writings from the period stress the importance of covering the head to keep the brain, which was thought to be a naturally cold organ, warm. And this was particularly important during um, certain times of day. So, for example, in the evening when the body was digesting, it was thought that that process drew heat away from the extremities of the body, such as the head. So it was particularly important to keep the head covered then. And these texts sometimes noted that illustrious um, and influential men from the ancient and the recent past, such as Hippocrates or the humanist Marsilio Ficino, were particularly attentive to the benefits of headwear. So I don't know if this is um, would have been in the back of um, Binda Altoviti's mind or something that he um, was thought was mindful of um, uh, when he consciously wore headwear um, like this. So two portraits in the exhibition consciously diverge from the accepted norms regarding gender and clothing and ostentatious displays of fashion that I've outlined, um, offering possible insights into their function and their meaning. And I'm going to touch on them briefly in the final part of my talk. So the first of these is the portrait of Lorenzo de' Medici, Duke of Urbino, and the father of Catherine de' Medici, whose opulence is really unparalleled amongst the other male portraits in the exhibition. 
So Lorenzo is shown wearing a pile-on-pile -pile velvet that's made up of tiny loops. And I've shown a detail here of the front of his doublet, which we can see. Um, uh, we can see the loops picked out here by Raphael. Um, and on the right, we can see a fragment from the Viennese collection, which originally had two different heights of loops. And it's partially worn in various areas, but we can pick out um, the technique and, and um, have a sense of how impressive uh, Lorenzo's doublet would have been uh, in real life. The portrait um, was painted as a betrothal gift for his bride-to-be, Madeleine de la Tour d'Auvergne, a distant relative of King Francis I of France. So it was intended very much for an international audience, and therefore he has um, fully embraced international court styles rather than local Florentine ones. And interestingly, this is reflected in a Medici inventory that lists the painting in 1553, where his dress is described as a la francese, so in the French style. And it's really very unusual to have descriptions of the styles of clothing in um, inventories of paintings at this time. Also significantly, it was designed to mark a festive event. And in um, this circumstance, it was necessary and, and even compulsory to wear much more flamboyant clothing. So in his book of the courtier, Baldassare Castiglione, an expert on court etiquette, um, said that uh, suggested that he preferred dark colors for ordinary clothing, um, but recommended that festive dress be trimmed, showy and dashy. Um, and he went on to say that on public occasions, such as festivities, so a wedding, for example, games, masquerades and the like, um, men should wear more flamboyant clothes. The combination of white and gold that we can see Lorenzo wearing was really common for weddings. Um, and although this link requires some further investigation, it's quite possible that Lorenzo actually wore this outfit for his wedding ceremony in Amboise, in France. Um, now, Laura Battiferri's outfit, on the other hand, is as austere as Lorenzo um, of Urbino's is eye-catching. If we compare, compare her clothing with the sartorial norms for double portraits, such as Bronzino's depictions of Bartolomeo and Lucrezia Panciatici, so here we see again this mirroring effect. His upper sleeves are dark um, black and the lower sleeves are uh, red. And this is reversed in um, Lucrezia's clothing on the right. Um, but Laura Battiferri's um, predominantly dark clothes and her uh, of her upper sleeves and her skirts position her alongside male subjects um, who shun frivolity. So in this way, her clothing appears to reflect the fact that she transcended um, traditional gender roles, being both author and muse. And her outfit follows ideals of sobriety and restraint. So in fact, the style of her dress and the very high neck of her shirt were rather outdated at this point. Um, so not the height of fashion. Um, but her coif, so her head covering and her veil, however, were staple items that we can find in wealthy Florentine women's marriage trousseau. Now, although Bronzino closely observes the details of the veil, so the pin at the center um, and the frayed edges of it, the accessory also takes on a symbolic role. Unusually depicted in profile, Battiferri does not encounter the viewer's gaze, and the transparent veil partially, if only symbolically really, dip, um, conceals her from us. So given the other Dantean references in the painting, Taken in combination, these elements could seem to allude to the theme of modes of seeing um, that are explored by Dante in his text, The Vita Nuova. Um, artists who painted the Florentine elites brought a new naturalism to the representation of dress, focusing on its sculptural and textural qualities right down to the smaller construction details of pins, seams, and stitches. By reading these images alongside contemporary discourses on fashion and its role in society, we begin to get a much better sense of how these outward surfaces contributed to the overall portrayal of the subject. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas, Deborah and Elizabeth, for your extraordinary and different points of view that you have offered on the period covered by the exhibition. I believe it, it will be of great help to those who admire the series of masterpieces on display at the Met until 11 October. Thank you again. I want to thank all three of our speakers. You know, 
the when Carlo and I laid out the exhibition, we felt it was so important to first of all establish the political transformation, and then the the manner in which Cosimo so astutely understood the importance of culture as a as a uh, as a way of bringing his uh, bringing his enemies, those who opposed him, together, and and this set the stage so beautifully. And then the transformation. Of, uh, of the individuals who inhabited Florence into these extraordinary people that we see before us. Uh, and Elizabeth, it's uh, such a pleasure to hear your insights into their costumes uh, and the multiple ways in which they, uh, we, we, we read them. The, as personality disappears uh, in the way that we understand it, as psychological portraiture disappears, a different kind of portraiture comes forward. Uh, and uh, the, to have you uh, helping us look at these has been such a great, great pleasure. And so I thank all three of our speakers for making this such a uh, really terrific experience and day. Thank you.